So uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here on Sunday. <laughs> um, this is it's so great to see old friends and new friends. Um, so I will uh, I will what I'll will do today is I'll briefly introduce this event and our authors and um, then the authors will read from uh, their work. Uh, after which we will talk about uh, the books and uh, the theme of place. Uh, we will have the opportunity uh, for the open Q&A, so please prepare your questions to drop in the comment box. Uh, and I'm, I'm in, I intend for this event to go for about an hour and a half. So um, to give you a little bit of the backstory of how this event came to be, uh, is um, I, uh, um, I uh, live in San Francisco, I'm a writer, I will do my own formal bio later, but um, I um, worked for Narrative Magazine for many years and um, I worked together with Alicia Ruverall um, and um, I saw the first draft of the novel that, uh, um, you know that that you know, many years ago, and when I heard that the novel is going to be published in uh, June in the UK, um, I, I wanted to celebrate it. I wanted to have a chance to celebrate it. And then together, Alicia and I started thinking about other recently published books that we wanted to celebrate together, and uh, we gathered uh, this group of uh, writers. Um, um uh, that that we really want to hear from so Tamim Ansari is an old um mentor of mine I feel like sorry the, the, yeah um he he's uh he uh he, ha he ran the San Francisco writers workshop for uh many years and that's where I um started out writing too and Tamim I, I will do formal bias later but it's just exciting for me to uh, hear from his new novel uh, and uh, uh, Tanya I met Tanya through a, a dear friend Suzanne Rendell uh, who's an amazing uh, writer as well um, and uh, yeah uh, Alicia do you want to yeah meant, uh, introduce Barbara briefly mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. so I know Barbara through Forge Fiction, uh, which is a literary, well, it's a writer's group essentially that's linked to the magazine, uh, Forge Literary Magazine, um, where she was an editor for a number of years and now is also part of the same writing group. And we've shared work back and forth this past year. And then we both realized our novels were launching, like the release date, the initial soft release was almost the same day. So it's just been really fun to kind of, you know, be on this journey together with, with our novels. This is her second, but, you know, my first, so it's just been really a pleasure. So, yeah, and uh, at the end, I, well, as a part of the readings, I will also read from my uh, manuscript. It's still a work in progress because until it's a final book, it's still, it's always a work in progress. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I will, let me just launch into the reading uh, part and I'll introduce Tamim. Uh, so Tamim Ansari is the author of The Invention of Yesterday Yesterday, Destiny Disrupted, Games Without Rules, West of Kabul, East of New York, among other books. For 10 years, he wrote a monthly column for Encarta.com and has published essays and commentary in the San Francisco Chronicle, Salon, Alternate, Tomepain.com, Edutopia, Edutopia Parade, Los Angeles Times, and elsewhere. He has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, Bill Moyers, PBS, The News Hour, Al Jazeera, and NPR. Born in Afghanistan in 1948, he moved to the U.S. in 1964. He lives in San Francisco. All right, is that it? Am I supposed to start now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you, uh, Olga told me that the mm -hmm. theme is, is is place. I got to say, sinking the ark. Uh, the theme is both time and place together. You know, mm -hmm. this is 1974 in Portland, Oregon. And Portland, Oregon in 1974, among other things, it was a big, small town, but among other things, it was like one of the places where something we call the counterculture now is really happening, an alternative community that was like 
communal houses and you know commun you know collective counterculture grocery stores and radio stations and this and that and so this novel is about a counterculture weekly called the Rose City Arc uh, and uh, at this paper nobody gets paid except the founder Walter and his uh, partner Grace who sets type I say uh, the time is important because this is set in 1974 and it's really important that nothing that happened after 1974 has happened yet so in this context you know computers don't exist uh terrorism has not happened alternate facts the reagan revolution none of that stuff has happened and yet the 60s are in the rearview mirror so this is a bunch of people who are like caught between these two eras and uh, they're at this paper now everybody's a volunteer except those two that i mentioned and in this scene that i'm going to read there is a young guy named Raul who wants to be a uh, cartoonist for the paper. And he meets two of the established members of the collective, Sval America. And they say, well, sit in on a collective meeting and, and do some sketching and we'll talk afterwards. So the collective meeting is about to start. So you guys are going to sit in on this collective meeting too now. Just then, Walter cleared his throat and all the conversation died away. People scrambled for chairs or for places on the floor. Raoul found himself jostled into a seat across the room from Merica and Sval. Walter settled upon a high stool and asked if anyone had any criticism of last week's issue. A storm of complaints broke out, mostly about typos and technical errors. Several people raged about a misplaced headline, pigging out on Pogo, which was written for a recipe column about possum soup made from roadkill, but had accidentally ended up above an article about the grand opening of the Men's Feminist Awareness Center. Each quibble dinned along until Walter cleared his throat, whereupon the noise died away and everyone waited in silence for Walter to pronounce. Each time Walter spoke, he had the air of a plain man puzzling through complex issues and making common sense of them as best he could. Everyone had raised good points, Walter would say, and he would summarize those points. By the time he finished, only one conclusion remained possible. But Walter himself never drew it. He let someone else dot the eye. Raoul sketched Walter as a majestic bearded lion peering out of the sky. He was Aslan. Then, about 15 minutes into the meeting, the pattern was broken. Just as Walter cleared his throat for one of his summaries, Merica jumped into the silence ahead of him. We're wasting time, she said. Week after week, we argue about typos. We never talk about the real issues at this paper, and we do have some real issues, folks. She waved a copy of the latest arc like a flag. How come we don't run more stories written by women? Oh, God, Ray Perkins erupted at once. Are we going to start a quota system around here? What the hell difference does it make who writes which stories? All that matters is the stories. Are they good? He gazed around the room looking for approval. What difference does it make? Merica countered. What difference? Well, let me hear me out. Will you let me finish? Ray shouted. What are you saying, Merica? We should run just any story as long as some woman wrote it. I say, forget who wrote it, man, woman, or dog. Don't even look to see. Woman or dog? God damn it, let me finish, said Perkins. Look at the story, not who wrote it. All I'm saying, standards, people. If we have space for 10 stories, let's run the 10 best stories. This isn't rocket science, folks. Quality is all that counts. And why am I the only one who gives a damn about quality? Two men broke into applause. One said, yeah. Raoul sketched Perkins as a big hyena surrounded by smaller hyenas, all of them with bloody jaws. Quality, Merica sniffed. What an interesting thing to say. So you think women can't produce quality writing? Is that how you explain it? Explain what, said Perkins. You haven't explained the fact that 80% of this paper is written by men. Is that a fact? Has anyone actually taken the time to count? Or are we just sort of kind of going on our feelings here? 
Well, let's just look at this week's paper, shall we? Merica opened her copy of the Ark. Page two, letters from the reader. Page two doesn't count. Well, my, 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 Merica persisted. Eight letters from readers and not one of them from a woman. Is it just my silly fem female intuition or is that on balance? Page three, big surprise. The struggle goes on, written by a man. Page four, two stories, both by men. The Watergate Seven convicted? Why couldn't a woman have written that? Page five and six. All right, we get the point. But in fact, the first full-fledged piece by a woman isn't until page 16. And you know what that one is? It's the recipe column about how to cook possums. In that moment, <laughs> Raoul saw an actual light shining from America's silhouette. He almost saw her wings. He sketched her as an avenging angel, Joan of the Ark. And oh my God, she was saying, oh my God, look, even this one's running under the headline, Portland Men Get It Together. Portland Men Get It Together? I mean, people, 21 pieces and only three by women. Come on. The Ark is supposed to represent statistics, sneered Ray. There's lies. There's damn lies. What lies? You count them, Ray. What's wrong? Girls can't count? Is that what you're saying? Go ahead, then. You count. Now, at last, Walter stirred and cleared his throat, most emphatically, into the silence. Excuse me. Into the silence, he said sternly. <laughs> I have never counted articles, America, but you do make a good point. It seems there has been some imbalance at the Ark. But Ray makes a point, makes a good point, too. There is no barrier to women writing for the art. Never has been. The process is open. So I'm not sure we need to beat ourselves up over the ratio. Granted, some pieces never get published, but only because there isn't room. And if you count those pieces, I think you'll find that 80% of them were written by men, too. In other words, you've put your finger on a problem, America, no doubt about it. But it is not a problem that begins at the ark, and it's not a problem we can solve here at the ark. It's a problem in the culture. Then came the customary beat of silence. But Sval caught this one short. Uh, excuse me, Walter. Heads, heads turned. Sval was frowning. I guess I'm, I'm not following you. The problem we're dealing with, it's... Uh, his frown deepened as he groped for the way to articulate this thought. Sexism, isn't it? Do you mean we have to wait until sexism has been eradicated from American culture before we can begin to deal with it here at the Ark? Ha! Good question. A heavy set, bristle headed woman belted out. <coughs> Raoul rendered her as a bear. Walter measured Sval with a look. In another moment, he might have made a reply, but Sval spoke first. But just to finish the thought, I wanted to say, Walter, I agree with you. The process is open, and that's good, and we shouldn't sell ourselves short on the credit we deserve for that. But if open isn't working, and it isn't working, is it? I mean, 80% of the paper is written by men. If that's our fundamental objective fact, then the facts say it isn't working, in which case our task, it seems to me, would be to change that fact. I, I, I only report how it looks from where I'm standing. He glanced around the room. Merica wore a fond look, Ray a puzzled one. Because this isn't just a newspaper, Sval said solemnly. This is one of the seeds of a new civilization. <clears throat> We're building a new world in the shadow of the one that's about to collapse. We have to start living like citizens of that new world already, because that's the only thing that's going to make it real. And we have to set up our own way of doing things, new ways, because we're living in the last days of the old civilization. We all know it. And once it collapses, it will be too late to work out the kinks. Walter was gazing thoughtfully at his fingertips. Raoul drew Sval as a Galahad, young and brave and noble and pure. Thank you, Sval. I couldn't have put it better myself. And don't you all see why women aren't writing for the paper? Because we don't see the paper as meeting our needs. Because anything we make reflects how we made it. And here at the Ark, how we do things isn't balanced. It's dominated by masculine energy. It just is. 
it goes on, but I will stop now <laughs> and give it over to the next reader. Thank you, guys. It's one of the joys and sorrows about reading this novel is that we're still arguing the same kind of argument 50 years later. It's, it's wonderful. Um, I'll introduce our next reader is Barbara Barrow. Um, Barbara uh, goes by she, her. She's the author of An, An Unclean Place and The Quelling, which was selected as a gold winner for literary fiction in the Forward Indies Award. Uh, her short stories have appeared in Faultline, Southern Humanities Review, Cimarron Review, and elsewhere. And she also publishes literary cr criticism in Environmental Humanities, Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and 19th Century Literature. Originally, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, she has lived in New York, Germany, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and now Lund, Sweden, where she teaches literature and writing and lives with her husband, daughter, and pets. Thank you. Um, so this novel, An Unclean Place, um, is a psychological thriller or murder mystery, um, and it's set part of it in the beginning is set in Atlanta um, in the 90s, kind of before Atlanta experiences um, really um, big changes in growth in the early 2000s. Um, and it's set in an experimental middle school and it's kind of focuses on like the little group that forms around this very charismatic um, middle school teacher who is also an idealist, I guess, to kind of pick up on some of um, Tamim's <laughs> themes. Um, so I'm excited for the conversation. But I'll just read from the first chapter. Um, so this is actually the very beginning of the book. Um, chapter one, and it takes place in spring 1992. The police came for Miss Ella, our eighth grade teacher, in the middle of Bryce's report on Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was a warm day in June. Bryce wore an insane clown posse t-shirt, a neon burst of grinning faces on his chest, and kicked the base of the podium with scuffed up Doc Martens as he delivered the report. We listened, our stomachs rumbling, to his sullen rendition of Roosevelt's 1936 I Hate War speech. Miss Ella sat behind us in the back of the room. We could feel her eyes and we sat up as straight as possible. I hate war, Bryce mumbled. The nation hates war. Even my little dog, Fala, hates war. The, do the door opened. Our principal, Jean, stepped into the classroom with a police officer, a man in a blue uniform that said City of Atlanta on the shoulder. His radio emitted a fuzzy belch of static. Bryce stopped. We all stared. I need to speak to Eleanor Halstrom, the officer said. We turned in our seats, following his gaze. Calmly, Miss Ella lifted her hand. She was wearing a gray blazer over the white Philadelphia Eagles t-shirt we knew so well. As usual, she had freshened her makeup after lunch so that her sharp brown eyes were ringed with liner, her small lips a bright red. One moment, she said. Bryce, go on. Um, okay, he said. Keep reading? Keep reading. We turned back to the front. He stumbled his way to the end of his presentation while the officer waited, his radio crackling every few moments, Jean shifting nervously beside him. We sat transfixed, not daring to look at each other. When Bryce was finished, Miss Ella put down her note bag, picked up her bag, oh, excuse me, put down her notepad, picked up her bag, and strode through the doorway, past the officer and Jean, her high top squeaking, not looking back. Jean gave a quick glance around the room and pulled the door shut. Don ran to the window first, then Tracy, then Kayla. The rest of us followed, and we formed a little semicircle in front of the glass. Bryce, who was the tallest, pulled up the blinds. We peered through the magnolia tree outside the window, straining to see past its haze of white blooms, and spotted the squad car parked below. He just put her in the back, Bryce said. What's she doing? asked Tracy. Just sitting, Bryce craned his neck. The officer is writing something in the front. Outside, the engine started, and the officer pulled out of the driveway, pausing by the flaking wooden sign that read, Stillwater Alternative School, a private academy nurturing today's youth for tomorrow's world. He did not use the siren or speed away as we had seen police cars do in movies. He simply signaled left, drove past the apartment complex next to our school, and disappeared. We stood, stunned, and stared at the empty driveway. On the windowsill, 
and the shade from the magnolia outside stood a paper mache statue of the ancient Greek priestess Cassandra, a statue Don had started but never finished. This Cassandra was urgent but incomplete, a woman with raised and gesturing hands but no eyes. We looked out into the new strange world and the Cassandra looked back at us, her empty face frozen in perpetual unuttered fury. We heard a choking sound, a kind of growl, and we turned. Don had moved away from the window and was sitting on the floor against the wall, underneath the long, taped up sheets of Miss Ella's handwritten notes, the ones that Amber had worked on all year. Dawn's face was bright red and her hands were shaking, her feet too. This is because of Amber, she said. We don't know that, said Tracy, but we all looked at Amber's desk, empty now, Amber still missing, as she had been for days. Amber snitched, Dawn repeated. She must have. I'll kill her. And I'll stop on that slightly ominous note. <laughs> and, you know, what's interesting, too, about this... What, what's uh, great about this novel, too, is that Miss Ella teaches the students these, um, what we recognize, I think, as progressive values, and yet you know, this novel starts with Miss Ella's arrest. So it creates this wonderful complexity uh, that that leads us through the novel. Um, and yes, I think maybe one of the themes of today is the do-gooders. Um, the, the, a lot of these characters seem to be do-gooders who may, may not be what they seem. <laughs> um, but let me introduce uh, Tanya, Tanya next. So Tanya Malik, is the author of the novels Hope You're Satisfied, uh, as well as Three Bargains, which received a Publishers Weekly starred review and a Booklist star starred review. Her work has appeared in Electric Literature, Off Assignment, LitHubSalon.com, Calix Journal, Baltimore Review, and other publications. She lives in San Francisco Bay Area, and I'll put uh, the links to everyone's websites later. Oh, well, thank you so much, Olga, and it's so nice to meet everyone. And um, I mean, I love those readings. Uh, my book is set uh, in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates in 1990, in the six months leading up to the first Gulf War, uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and that prompted a US military response. So essentially, the time of Operation Desert Shield. Dubai at that time was a very different place. It's not the megalopolis that we know today. It's just kind of this overbuilt place. It was a small coastal town, still a trading hub. And it was still a place that was filled with guest workers, as well as it was very popular with Western European tourists. So with the, with the, with the invasion though, for the first time, there was an influx of Americans and basically it was American servicemen who were there in preparation for the war. So in the scene I'm reading, um, my main character, Rhea, and her best friend, Grace, have befriended two American servicemen they met in the market. And they are walking around the city uh, looking for a sex worker slash madam called Janet. And they start off at a local Tex-Mex restaurant. And the name of the restaurant is Pancho Villas. We made our way to the Tex-Mex restaurant Pancho Villas, which served the usual variety of tacos, burritos, and chimichangas prepared by Indian cooks with ingredients sourced from places like Brazil and Denmark, and if we were lucky, avocados from Kenya. It was quite authentic, we professed to the boys. How would you know, they countered, and we agreed that they had a point. We seated ourselves and ordered beers. I looked around to see if Janet was there, so I could set up the girls for Cesar's party. It was never hard to track down Janet. She favored the same few places in town for the precise reason that she wanted to be easily found. It was early and there was no one on the dance floor yet. Colorful paintings of cacti and maracas hung on the walls. The restaurant greeter was a four foot tall man who in keeping with the theme supported a black embroidered blero jacket white ruffled shirt and straw sombrero with a bright purple rim. He was dark skinned from Eastern India and had a generous mustache. Everyone called him Pancho. By the end of the night, some plastered patron would think it hilarious to pick him up and toss him around 
and call him their little pinata. Pancho was quite good humored about it, but the Americans didn't seem to know how to react to him and his wide grin as he approached our table to say hello. It didn't look like they found him as delightful as the rest of us did. I asked Pancho if he had seen Janet, but he shook his head and said that she was probably on the other side of the creek today. We finished our drinks and Pancho saluted the servicemen as we exited. Along the creek's embankment, families and tourists sat at tables with tiny glass cups of mint Soleimani tea. Evening compute commuters hopped up and down the steps leading to the waiting abras, the white water taxis that were no more than slips of wood with a motor cuffing up strong fumes. Striped flags in the red, green, and white colors of the UAE festooned the tented roofs of the boats. The wind blew in from the mouth of the creek, bringing, bringing with it the strong, briny scent, scent of the ocean. When a boat pulled up to the dock, we jumped aboard and chugged across the creek, crammed together with 20 other passengers. This was the cheapest way to get to the other side. Seagulls careened overhead, squawking and diving into the waves. Moored along the approaching bank were rugged wooden vessels of teak and rope with sharply curved prows and soaring triangular sails. Mountains of cargo were stacked precariously on their decks. Da these Taos were the original pirate ships, the gold smuggler's best friend, the lifeline for U.S. embargoed countries, where the manifest might state the vessel was going to an African country, but once on the open seas, it would hairpin turn to the east and sailed to Iran with its forbidden cargo of aircraft parts and Sony Walkmans. Along the length of the creek, a few of the city's tallest buildings came into view, and high as they were, they didn't compete with the skyscrapers we saw in pictures of Manhattan or any other big American city. That's the telephone company, Gray said to Burke uh, about his question about a glass building topped with a giant concrete golf ball and radio antenna. It was said that America had the most powerful am army in the world, but these milky-faced boys laughing and exclaiming at the sights were not who I imagined heading straight towards Saddam Hussein and his elite Republican guard. What would Saddam Hussein and his barrel chest garnished with medals do to them? Saddam, who greeted his people with right arm, arm outstretched, hand open ominously, like he might bless them or crush, crush their tracheas. Had anyone told the boys of the palace of the end? If we knew of the basement chamber in Baghdad, where Saddam Hussein regularly severed prisoners' limbs and private parts, electrocuted children, and dropped his enemies into vats of acid, surely they must know too. Did American mothers let their boys go so easily into unknown places, fraught with such terrible dangers? I didn't want to feel sorry for the Americans. It wasn't my job to worry about them. Still knowing that their fate was to go up against a man the world called our generation's Hitler, I feared for them. And then there was Grace, cheeks flushed from the windy ride, ponytail swinging, grinning about something, never complaining about being involved in my problems. If these American boys couldn't hold off Saddam Hussein, then ha her ambitions, her plans so carefully crafted would come to nothing. Saddam would put her an end to her promising future with one command. Disembarking from the boat, we trooped through the spice souk, its narrow lanes lined with gunny sacks of aromatics from dried lemons and cucumbers to cardamom, turmeric and saffron, to heaps of dried roses and mounds of frankincense. On the other side of the souk was a hunting themed bar frequented by businessmen who jetted in and out of the city. Grace waited with Jack and Burke as I ducked inside. The bar section was busy. Among the blazers and loosened ties, I spotted Janet talking with one of the businessmen. I sent someone be behind me and saw that Jack had followed me in. He was a curious guy and I gave him a questioning look, but he shrugged and stayed close to me as I tried to catch Janet's attention. Janet was a petite Filipina with slow eyes framed by silken bangs and long black hair. She wore a figure blugging hack black dress and red pump heels today chatting up a nice looking gentleman who glanced from her to his beer. He gave her a smile and shook his head and she moved down to the next one, perching herself on the stool next to him. Hello, I love you, I heard her say as we approached. So Janet has a way of declaring her feelings up front, but <laughs> this was a way 
this was a place that, you know, like I said, had a lot of guest workers, but there was no path to citizenship at that time. So all these people came in just for their labor. They came into work and then they left. But as in the meantime, they had these makeshift families with each other. They had intense relationships, romantic and otherwise. But because there was no path to friendship, there was, uh, you know, there, there, there was there, there was no future there basically for them. And it was just interesting to explore what they did to that to to these relationships and to their psyches living in such a place. Thank you. You do that really um, beautifully and in a really intense way. And the one of the dramas of that uh, book of the world, right, is that it is so poised on change about to come. And I, it's it's you, you yeah, the, you create this really intense environment uh, with really interesting characters. And I kind of want to ask you for the continuation of that novel. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I know we've spoken about that already. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so our next reader today is Alicia Ruverall, uh, who goes by she, her. She's a lecturer in creative writing at the University of Salford. Uh, and is the author of Dry River and co-author, I Was Content and Not Content, the story of Linda Lord and the closing of Penobscot Poultry. Favorably, favorably, favorably reviewed in the New York Times and nominated for the OHA Book Award. Her stories, nonfiction and poetry have appeared in the Manchester Review, The Independent and Street Cake, among other journals. A 2008 recipient of the Elizabeth George Foundation Writing Grant, she received her creative, creative writing MA and PhD from University of Manchester Center for New Writing. And in, 19, uh, in 2019, she was an inaugural artist in residence at the John, John Rylands Library to develop a short story collection themed on place and migration. Dry River is her first novel. Great, thank you so much, Olga. So um, Dry River is essentially the story of um, Sarah Greystone, who is a public defender who's had a disastrous court case where um, she defended an African-American woman who was accused of assault against her male, white male abuser. Um, and uh, she has to put the kids, um, her client's children up on the stand. It's a really, really tough case. Um, she and her husband, uh, you know, after she's sort of reeling after this disastrous court case, moved to, the, uh, to California and uh, a move that's supposed to get them back on their feet, but they've arrived during the economic downturn uh, and um, family members are ill, Sarah doesn't return to work. And the novel opens with um, uh, a scene in which uh, Sarah meets um, Ty, or meets, sorry, meets um, Zeke Harris, who is a um, stranger who complicates her world, essentially. And she's there with um, her sons, Jacob and Mark. I'm picking up the reading from the very next scene and then I'll do another excerpt a bit later and I'll contextualize that as well. Uh, and it is set, this first chapter is set in Mill Valley, 2007. The novel moves back and forth in time over 15 years in five towns in California and in North Carolina where they have migrated from. That night when my husband Ty came home, I didn't mention Zeke, but Jacob did. He was nice. Oh, Ty said, raising a brow, and who is he? I hid my smile. A new neighbor, I said, a builder doing some work for the library. I tore up the lettuce, tossed it into the spinner, but pulled the string too hard. It broke. Drat, I said, dropping it in the trash. There was no fixing it. It meant another expenditure. Yeah, it was really a hassle getting the stroller up the hill to the library. I won't do that again, I said. Actually, I was already thinking about doing it again. Okay day, Ty asked. He leaned against the counter and stared past me to the magnolia tree outside. It was holding onto a few blossoms still. Sarah, he asked to my silence, 
because by then we'd become increasingly silent. Whole days would pass without our saying anything of real import. It was all logistics, the kids stay at preschool, Jacob's dental check, Ty's IT boss insisting the client had 54 new requirements they'd missed. Jacob was bouncing around in front of us, though Ty didn't see him. Ty was watching my face. I looked away. I didn't say that this chance encounter made my day because there was no sense to it. There was no isolating this feeling. There was no knowing if there was any deeper feeling there at all, just curiosity. The next morning, Ty got up at 6 a.m., which we, he had been doing a lot of recently for work. I followed behind, trying not to wake the boys. We were still getting up together at that point. The mornings were always rushed because we had to fit in what we could before they woke. It was the only real time we had to talk. Are you getting the dry cleaning or am I? I made the appointment but had to cancel. Jacob had a field trip that day. Sunlight cast shadows on the wood floors. As he padded down the staircase in his slippers, Ty kicked some of the toys at the base of the staircase by mistake. Shh, I said, as if he just dismantled the entire house. Sarah, it's not going to wake them, he said. Ty began making his lunch to take to work while I fixed his eggs. He scanned the fridge. I pointed him toward last night's leftovers. We were in the California economy now. We recycled food daily. He poured his coffee, took a seat in the alcove by the window, and stared out of it. I slid the plate of eggs across the table and took a seat opposite him so he would have to look at me. I remembered my folks talking things over when I was growing up. My dad hunched over the table, his face steadily watching my mom's. But Ty seemed so distracted all the time. I'd been thinking about money lately, or the lack of it. We were making it, but barely. Do you think I should go back to work, I asked. It wasn't just the income. I hadn't practiced law in five years. I missed the public defender office, missed the intellectualism of the East. Since coming back West, I couldn't seem to find a strand of it embedded anywhere out here in this granite rock. I don't know, sir. I think it would be more difficult. Can we do more difficult? He took another sip of his coffee and turned to watch the hummingbird outside as it fluttered and dropped from sight. So the next excerpt is from a fair bit later in the book. Um, Ty, who works in IT, which has been very volatile in this time period, has been laid off now for the second time. And the other thing to know about this section is that um, Ty uh, is a birder or was a birder um, before work took him down. <laughs> Um, the next day, Ty went to work, and after taking the boys to preschool, I got in the car and drove, which is what I did when I couldn't focus on studying for the bar. That day, I drove to West Marin, wending my way toward the coast. The hills were a deep emerald green. This year's drought was over. It was our seventh season, and we had grown accustomed to the rain. Gulls cast overhead, weaving above the road. As I drove through barren hills toward a bank of steady fog, I thought again about how we had landed here. When we moved west, I had believed my tenacity could stretch to my husband. I thought my locomotion would carry his slower, more southern pace, but it couldn't. Ty was paralyzed while I couldn't stop my forward momentum, wherever it might lead. I could no longer separate myself from the place where I was from. Ty wasn't someone who opened up easily when things were hard, and the impending layoff was definitely hard. He kept to himself, his face still and unresponsive as a stone. Like the smooth stones we found on that river, my brothers and I used to walk near Davis when we visited my mother's family in Sacramento. It was a dry river with long, flat rocks, shale that you could throw and keep throwing. This was the land where you could do anything, reinvent yourself again and again. But did you even recognize yourself when you were finished? Ty's making over was an internal process. It took the form of a slow chiseling of self, the way waves break down rocks. He woke early to get on the computer, to search for jobs. He pattered into Jacob's room to wake him and say good morning. 
He kissed my forehead after coffee before driving to work. He left home early, arrived home late. His days were relentless. For anyone, it would have felt like a grind, but for Ty, who preferred to be out on marshland watching birds, it was grinding and it ground him down. Thank you, Alicia. Um, yeah, the one of the things about this novel that I love is um, the the reality of children and parenthood and the pressures that puts on an American family. And I think American parenthood is something uh, very special and unique that 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 you give us a really great sense uh, of. And um, and yes, and. Uh, I, in other ways, this book also fits in the theme of the good, do, the do-gooders whose own morals come to be questioned. Um, but um, as, yeah, as that burgeoning new relationship uh, comes into the marriage, so uh, yeah, and yeah, I will send the links, include the links to all the novels. Um, there, I highly recommend all of them. Um, so I'm gonna now read from my own manuscript. It's not, yeah, it's it's very far from a published book yet, but uh, it's it's real. I finished it. <laughs> uh, it's called <laughs> "Don't Don't Shut the Door," and um, the premise is pretty simple. So my protagonist and narrator is uh, Rita. She's a 13 year year old. Uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, the year is 1990, um, also just before the collapse in 91, uh, and her parents have just decided to emigrate, and she doesn't want to. So how does she navigate this agonizing situation? And I'll read um, a short passage from about page six of the book at this point. This is the end of the summer season, uh, 1990, and Arita is coming back to Leningrad, to the city, after three months in the uh, remote countryside. She's preparing to start eighth grade in a few days. All through the hike to the station, the train ride, and the subway ride, I had a feeling that Mama was watching me, waiting for something. I watched her, too, trying to understand what she was thinking. She attempted to start the conversation several times, but both the train and the subway were crowded and she didn't want to be overheard. She waited until we were almost home. How you've grown, she said, soon after we stepped onto the escalator about to exit the subway. She took my head by the chin and turned it toward herself. That felt weird and they jerked my head, head away. Don't deny me this pleasure, she said, holding on to my face. Your hair is getting bushy. I dare anyone to say that your nose is too big. Once we pull all your hair back, you look just like Cleopatra, except you're too pale. I wish we could have gone to the Black Sea. Children need sunshine, and this summer you didn't get any. She sighed. It's not the looks that count. I muttered, relieved that we were finally coming to the end of the escalator. She had to let go of my head. I hated the way her words made me feel like a showpiece in a museum. I wanted to escape the comparison with others. Was my nose too straight or not straight enough? I didn't want to think about it. Was this really the thing she'd been gather gathering courage to tell me? You're talented too, Mama said, misunderstanding me. It, it wouldn't hurt a girl to take an interest in art and literature, but perhaps that will come later. Mama, stop, please. You'll be 14 in January. It's time for you to stop acting like a child, Rita, and to look at yourself objectively, Mama said, turning around to step off the escalator. We exited the station building, and I was instantly plunged into the middle of the city life. In the gathering dusk, Prospect Stachik was as busy as ever. Six lanes of traffic illuminated by the headlights of cars streaming to and from downtown. Across the street to the right of, across the street, uh, the chimneys of the Kirovsky factory spewed pale smoke into the dark overcast sky. 
To the left, the small park in front of uh, Dom Culture was a welcome spot of greenery. Its trees and shrubs had not been shorn in a while and had spread their branches far above the electric poles as though hugging them and trying to return the wood to its natural state. I breathed in the familiar scent of subway ventilators, a dizzy mix of machine oil and burnt rubber. Mama was already halfway down the stairs and I rushed to catch up with her. It was warmer in this part of the city than it had been in the countryside and the air had a metallic tinge to it. It wasn't truly warm, but under the weight of my backpack, my body filmed over with sweat. As we got down the stairs and walked toward the park, I saw that despite all the recent rains, the aspens and lindens looked dry, leaves brown at the edges and the acacia shrubs shriveled, unhealthy. The grass thick in places was trampled over and covered with mud and fallen leaves and peppered with cigarette butts, beer bottles, bits of newspaper, old products of human labor discarded at the very time and place where things lost their usefulness. As we walked by a bus stop, I noticed that the newspaper boards hadn't been updated since the past spring and the pages had crimpled and yellowed, yellowed over the weeks. Behind them, a group of people was gathering around a man with a guitar, picking the strings, trying to work up a melody. I wished for Tsoi, but he veered into Laskavi Mai's White Roses, a meaningless though catchy pop tune. Don't look, Mama said, as she, and she increased her pace, but it was too late. I was already seeing a man open the fly of his trousers to urinate under a tree near the sidewalk without any care for privacy. A hideous, shapeless thing dangled between his legs, and though I averted my eyes, I couldn't shake off the image. I felt soiled as though I just stepped in dog shit. There are going to be some changes at your school, Mama said, so matter-of-factly that at first I didn't think this was the conversation she'd been preparing for, or was this an opening for something bigger? I'll, I'll stop here. Um, so thank you again, all of you for being here on Sunday um, and for su supporting uh, the, these wonderful books and us. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, start with a few questions to the authors, but please uh, write up your own and put them in the chat and uh, we'll try to get uh, to all of them. Um, so. I, uh, one of the things that these novels definitely have in common, and, and let me just say one more thing that these are all such accomplished novels and they're accomplished in the sense of the writer's craft and also I think in the quality of thought that shines through the pages. They, they really, mm, they, they really transmit wisdom, I think. And I, it, it's, it's, I feel, I felt like I, understood something better about the world around me having finished them. So, and one of the ways in which they do it is by reflecting very uh, strongly on a particular time and place uh, in, in which they're set. They're about time in a particular era. So I wanted to ask each of you to talk about uh, what was the most important thing for you to try to get on paper about uh, the, the, these places and the time. What was drawing you back there? So let's start. Yeah, Tamim, if you're ready to uh, start. I have to unmute myself? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, uh, one thing I really, I should, I should back up a little bit and say, I first wrote this novel in the 80s. And I didn't do anything with it. I just put it away. Um, and uh, I discovered it again in a box I was going through when the pandemic started. And like a lot of people, I was shut in my house and I baked all the bread I could break. And so I was looking through old papers and I found this thing and, and I found all these, these six characters I had created. They were still alive in there, you know. <laughs> they, they've been in this box in my basement for 20 years. They hadn't died. And I, I read the, the, what I'd written, and I worked on it again. But what I was concerned to do was to try to put my reader and myself in that particular moment 
when the future had not happened. And the reason for that, or, you know, the, the thing that I was most concerned about that is that I feel like everything we understand about the world is related to the context we're in at that moment. And uh, we lose the context as we, as we move through history. And we have a certain kind of uh, chauvinism of the present. We think that all of human history has come to now and we finally discovered the truth at last. And so we look down on earlier truths. So I just wanted to, you know, get back to that time and what was, how everything seemed, and not just to me, but to six different people who were plausibly people that might have lived then. None of them are anybody I knew. The novel did not really come alive until none of the people were anyone I actually knew in real life. They were just, they only lived there. So that's what I was concerned about. And I feel like the context thing is something that actually turns out to be what all my life I've been thinking about and I'm still thinking about. Yeah, um, I think I was interested in part in sort of, um, so I grew up in Atlanta and it changed quite a lot. And um, I kind of wanted to go back to a time sort of before it had this really big boom after the 96 Olympics and kind of remember what those neighborhoods were like. Um, maybe a time when there were kind of different attitudes about the liberal arts as well. So one of the ways in which this teacher is able to kind of capture a large student following is um, that so many people kind of have faith in like the project of reading and learning about history and this idea that it kind of builds this like complete humanist education. Um, and then I think, you know, place and context kind of like Tamim was saying, um, go together and in some ways, maybe also like a little bit of nostalgia about like pre-digital communication. Um, so there's like a lot of uh, scenes in this novel where the students um, call each other on landlines and they do like a three-way call. And they like have to like take the phone to the other room. It's like the cord winding around and everybody in the house knows who's calling and um, pay phones. Um, so I think just trying to remember what was, that was like when um, phone calls and things like that were kind of these big occasions uh, was really fun to think about and, and to remember. Oh, just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, tiny. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, reflecting back to what Barbara was saying and even to me, I think, you know, I read or I heard somewhere that a place has an internal monologue. And to me, what was really important about writing about this place was how do I tap into that and amplify it for a reader? Because if you can point to Dubai on a map today, it still exists. But the Dubai I was writing about does not exist anymore. You know, at that time, there was no world tallest building or ski slope in the middle of the desert. So I really wanted to bring in, again, that time and place um, also to address presumptions people might have had about a Middle Eastern city. Many people might, readers might think it's like Saudi Arabia where you have a moral police um, and it's more conservative. But Dubai was very popular with Western European tourists. And for that reason, you know, you could wear shorts, you could wear swimsuits on the beach, you could drink alcohol in bars and, and restaurants, but yet there was Sharia law. And so the dichotomy was in, the, in that place, in, Dubai, in, the, in that place was very interesting to explore. And um, also I think what Tamim was saying that we lose the context as we, of history as we move towards time setting it during those those that time of the first gulf war a lot of us thought that the first gulf war was the good war whereas the second gulf war kind of you know led us down this wrong path but everything the new wave of terrorism that we see actually started with that first gulf war uh when osama bin laden got upset about american troops being in saudi arabia and everything that followed to all the terrorist attacks through that decade to the fact that, you know, we still have to take off our shoes when we go through the TSA. So I think that time was is kind of forgotten and kind of has been slotted into a wrong context, I would say. And, um, you know, and then to filter that place and the time through the, the eyes of these characters was what kept drawing me back to this landscape and was what kept kept me exploring. Alicia. Okay, great. 
I'll go ahead. Um, so to some degree, um, I didn't really start out focusing on place um, consciously, um, but what was happening in that place. Um, we were actually in Northern California, north of San Francisco in that time period, and people were losing their homes to for foreclosure um, as a result of the global crash. And um, I was, um, well, we can get into this more about sort of how and why we started projects, but that, that was what shaped my interest in this. Um, I was doing, uh, in some ways, a retelling of Wallace Stegner's uh, Angle of Repose, in which a family moves from the East to the West, and it's, they work in mining, and then they move around, and you see the challenges of that. So the book is very much about economics in a particular time and place. Um, uh, I too am very interested in that time and place intersection. And one of the um, audience mentioned in the chat about um, uh, uh, specificity, essentially, of time and place. And one of the pieces I really like to teach on place is in a book called um, Is Life Like This by John Dufresne. He's a writer I studied with at the Mendocino Writers Conference an age ago. Um, and he talks about how in order to get to the universal, you have to start with the specific. And so what I was doing in each of these landscapes was trying to capture the specificity of that world, um, you know, whether it was Marin in 2007, 2008, or North Carolina in 1997. I mean, I remember hearing about um, Atlanta and that sense of the boom that was coming up just a few states over. We really could um, could sense that change in that in that really major city in that part of the of the states. Um, but for Sarah and Ty, place figures largely in part because they're stymied in that place. They've got um, uh, the the mother's ill. Um, you know, they've got they're raising young kids. It's it's complex, and um, and to some degree, what the novel tries to do is capture the aridity of California. I know I read some of the more lush uh, excerpts. But that dryness of the landscape is meant to be a metaphor of the sort of economic aridity in their lives. So for me in this novel, place is, is sort of multiple. It's both, you know, setting and environment in that specific geographic world, but it's also about economic place and how, how economics shape us uh, in ways that we don't always understand. So it's kind of the, it's the decline of a marriage and it's a decline of an economy of the, of the U.S. economy, really it's meant to be as a, as a metaphor. So. That was my aim at the time. <laughs> and I'll just briefly say that, yeah, for me, I'm investigating some of the, uh, well, uh, well, for me, for me, the, the draw uh, to Leningrad in the in 1990s specifically is that the next year, everything changes. And it, it, it is so hard, like, to even remember that system of values that vanished completely. And it was a radically different system of values. It was not the dream of, uh, you know, communism or socialism in the, by no measure. It was just different, you need its own culture where the children's future was determined in a large part by their participation in the, you know, the for you know forms of communist organization uh and there um and and everyone had these ideas of themselves uh with their possible futures but that was all cut off and and um and it's it's uh it's hard to uh, capture it and the way i'm approaching is is that by by you know the this family's De departure this family's departure that allows me to look at the the things that um that are still there or how how they they're saying goodbyes to that um uh, uh the thing that will disappear um and so yeah so this novel is, is in manuscript form a third draft all of your these these books are published and they have all such interesting histories and i can never get enough and i'm so curious i know uh, to, to to know how these novels uh came to be published and yeah tamim started out saying right that you wrote this novel in the 80s <laughs> and I, yeah um but um yeah do do uh and yeah, do, um, do I would love for you to yeah a little, say a little bit more about that. Um, 
on? Well, I, I will say this. I, I wrote this novel in the 80s and, you know, of interest only to you, not to the rest of you, but I'll, <laughs> I'll mention this to you. When I first joined the San Francisco mm -hmm. Writers Workshop, which later on I became the, the director of it or the facilitator, I was reading bits of this novel to that <laughs> group of people like 40 years ago. Uh, and when I finished it, I felt like, okay, this is my practice novel. I don't really know how to write a novel, so I wrote this, my practice novel. Now I'll write my real novel, the one that I can sell and I'll make a million bucks off of it. And I started working on another novel, which I also never published. Uh, in fact, I, I finished that one just before 9-11. And uh, my, uh, I had an agent then, and my agent said, I can't publish this, you know, I can't sell this. You got to write a nonfiction thing. So the next 20 years, I was writing nonfiction, mostly about Afghanistan and all these, you know, war, of, war on terror sort of related things. I will just mention that, I, that I'm only now finishing that other novel, too. I've written two novels yeah. in my life, and I'm just now finishing both of them. So, uh, you know, for me, I got to say, the, the thing that drives me now with these two novels is I just want to get them right. I just want to say the thing I wanted to say. And I feel like I did that with Sinking the Ark. So now I don't, you know, whatever happens to it, happens to it. My job was the job of a writer. And the writer's job is to is to say the thing you want to say apart from any consideration of publication or anything else. You know, so that's what I did with Sinking the Ark. Once it was done, I I published it myself, you know, and I got my um uh uh my uh, son in law involved, uh made the cover. I love the cover mm -hmm. actually. I don't know where here, this is the cover of <laughs> And this is the guy's, uh, uh, he's, he's an artist and I love the, the cover he did. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, I, I feel like what I did with it after that, because I got very busy with many things that assailed my life. And I call what I did with it artisanal marketing, which means <laughs> I only told the people who uh, had some relationship to the events that I was you know, chronicling that I was fictionalizing and sinking the ark. Um, I, you know, I, I told them about it and some of them have read it. So that's what I've done with the book. I, I, I have to say when I, when I read it again, and it was one of the things that struck me, I wrote it all those years ago. One of the things that struck me was it felt like the, a lot of the issues in the novel were so modern. I, I felt like there was, there was so much happening then that was the beginning of things that are happening now with, you know, the environmental things mm -hmm. that are going on in the novel, with the collective, how to operate, collective identity, all of these various issues. They're already there 40 years ago. I thought that was interesting. I wanted to bring them to fruition. So that's what I did. You did it so well. Thank you. Um, Barbara. Uh, yeah, so um, this book also had a really long genesis. Um, I think it started, I had a novel length version of it maybe 15-ish um, years ago and it, I felt like it wasn't right. <laughs> and then I published like part of it as a short story in a literary magazine, which is now defunct. Um, and a friend of mine at the time said, I think when you write this novel, it's going to be from that perspective. The short story was in that first person plural point of view, that like collective we. And my mm -hmm. friend was like, I think that's how you have to tell the story. And I hadn't told it that way yet. So um, I kept fiddling with it. And I think um, I published another novel in the meantime and some other things. And um, I came back to it, I think, seriously in 2017. Um, it went through 11 drafts. I'm like really lucky to be in a writer's group, a novel writer's group where they were willing <laughs> to read not all 11 of those drafts, but two or three of them. Um, and I spent a lot of time just like, I think like to me was saying, trying to get stuff right. So um, a lot of the sort of time I spent was not only trying to get the prose and the story down, but also just trying to get the details to feel authentic. So like one of my characters is really, um, She's an artist and she's really obsessed with a painting by Paula Rego called The Family, which if you get a chance to see it is a super wonderful um, kind of frightening, scary painting. 
Um, but so I spent just a week looking at that painting in an art book and like writing different descriptions of it and looking at it from different angles and kind of focusing on different parts. Um, one of my characters is a punk rocker. So I spent a lot of time just listening to the Dead Kennedys on my headphones and I was like going for walks to try to think about like what he was listening to. Um, so I think that was the most fun and I'm um, trying to like watch sculpture videos on YouTube because my character was making sculptures and I wanted to be able to describe how she did that. So that was like the really fun stuff. And then the other stuff was just like really hard work of drafting and redrafting. Um, and I eventually published it with um, the press that also published my first novel and with whom I had a good relationship. So that was the outcome. It's yeah the 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 we point of view is really works really well for this yeah for this group for the first part you used it for the first part of the novel and then we zero in on the story of Amber and Don that that get introduced in the excerpt that you read and it's really well plotted and I yeah that if it takes eleven drafts but oh my god <laughs> eleven drafts <laughs> is a lot <laughs> it's a lot of work um. And yeah, uh, uh, Tanya, I... Uh, yeah, so I know the publishing process is <laughs> always such an ebb and flow. Um, I came up with the idea of the book uh, as I was finishing my last book. And, you know, that first line of the book, the shake was on the wrong plane, just kept coming back to me. And I just thought I need to write about Dubai, which I had <laughs> lived in for a short period of time, just because of all the contradictions and the, like I said, the dichotomy of the place. But what was interesting to me, you know, you know, when you go out with your novel, that there will be some challenges. And one of the challenges faced by this novel that was no one knew how to categorize it. Like, mm -hmm. should it, you know, it, it should it be an office novel? It does have office mm -hmm. workers. It's like low level white collar office workers. So, it, But it was not necessarily an office book. Was it a war novel or not? It was set during a war, but it wasn't a conventional war with battlegrounds and you know, prisoners of war and people being dragged off the street and executed. But it did seem at that time, people thought this was going to be World War Three. Was it his historical fiction? No, it was too recent to be historical fiction or not. Uh, was it a thriller or was it not? And again, the thriller, it does have a lot of thriller elements, but it also has some literary elements. So they were not sure how to categorize this book. So I, what came through to the end is thank God for great independent presses, uh, you know, especially the one that published this book is this uh, wonderful independent press in LA. Um, and I remember my agent, Nikki, Nikki Richardson saying this to me about how they have such a, and I agree with this, such a strong point of view. And I really did see that. It's great to have an independent press with a strong point of view, not because in the way that they publish the same kind of thing or they're publishing only the same genre, but they know what they want when they see it. Mm -hmm. And then they are, you know, and they don't categorize literature for the sake of categorization. And so then, you know, it's, and when they, when they, when they can't get your work, they're really putting, you know, they, they're behind it with total faith. And as a writer, really, that's what you want. So to me, it was, that was the really fascinating and challenging part of the whole process was, to see how the book was received and perceived uh, when it was out there. Yeah, it, and yes, as somebody <laughs> said, hurra, hurra, and you said, right, hooray for the independent presses. Um, <laughs> right. but because the, the question that is so limiting, the question of genre, because that is one of the things that is such a thrill about your novel that it, it, it keeps surprising you in the directions that it, it goes and it is so wonderful. Yeah. and. I, I really love that experience. Um, and yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm so yeah. glad. And I that... think when readers, when I think when readers pick up the book, often they don't pick it up, putting it in a box, you know, they, right. maybe they think, oh, today, it's really a mood thing. Someone says today, I feel like reading thriller, or I feel like reading literary. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, odd <laughs> process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Alicia, tell us about your, yeah, your journey. Well, it, it was nice to hear that Barbara's and um, <laughs> Tamim's uh, journeys were pretty long as well. Um, I first drafted the novel about 14 years ago or so on um, uh, National Novel Writing Month. A friend dared me to, um, to, to join her in that venture. And um, 
my running joke is I was rather typically late to the event. <laughs> and I, I think I did it in 24 or 26 days or something. It was only about 50,000 words at that point. It was the bare bones. And then I just kept revising. I worked with um, an editor, a professional editor, um, I, but I couldn't get the, the work right. Um, and, and my agent who'd really taken me on for nonfiction just I think she felt it wasn't it wasn't ready it wasn't right so I ended up doing a graduate course and then that I had to produce new work for that I, I was able to work um, on the MA uh, on the novel writing some new material but then I had to set it aside when I got the when I came on for the PhD they I needed to do a new novel so like to me I set the old one aside wrote the newer one um, and then actually well Olga when you read it for me in 2016 and you said take it off the shelf um, that's what I did. Uh, it had I, I did submit it pretty widely. I submitted both novels um, to 100 different uh, presses, publishers, prizes, you know, for agents, what have you, over a couple year period. So really, I suppose if you do the math on that, so that's 50 <laughs> agents or editor publishers for for Dry River. Um, uh, it was picked up by um, Chapel Town Books or Bridge House Publishing, which does their novels. Um, and it is a small press here in Manchester. Um, uh, like to me, I was able to draw on, um, I had a little bit of say on the title, I was on the cover page. And so the design was done by uh, my colleague, uh, Valerie Warden's husband, uh, Andy Brody, who did just an absolutely brilliant job. We spent hours talking about the book and about how to represent it visually. So that was a piece of that of that journey. Um, I, I too, on this genre thing, um, it, you know, it was pretty straight literary fiction. It was pretty quiet. Um, I have this court case in it and several editors at different points said, you're confusing the reader with this court case. But it was such a crucial piece of the book that I just left it in. Um, and I, I, over the time, over those many years, I moved um, the timelines a lot. I'm very interested in time and memory, having come out of folklore and oral history originally, and how people narrate and tell their stories. Um, so there were just lots of things that needed to be gotten right, as it were, as, as a couple of people have said. And that just takes time. And then down to the court case is what I worked on most intensively the last couple of months. Um, I had the good fortune that I had people in my mix who'd either been uh, a deputy DA or a public defender, a cousin of mine. Um, he'd not read the novel. I wasn't going to ask, put him through that. But I spent hours going over the court case um, with with detail um, with both a, a, a friend of mine who had been a deputy DA and helped me craft some of the plot components around the court case. So there were just lots of pieces to that. It's my equivalent of Barbara, you know, putting on the headset and running to, to dead Kennedy's, you know, <laughs> you, you have to, I, I feel like there's a way of method writing that parallels probably method acting where you just have to become your characters and really get in their heads. Um, and it just takes a while, it takes a while to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I um I'm concerned about time. Um, just well, I have what uh, I have a lot of questions and we, uh, and lots of topics to talk about. But I would love to see if uh, anybody in the audience has uh, thoughts or questions um, uh, to our readers. And and um, at this point, yeah, maybe um, I'll give you another moment to think. Uh, but uh, let me also um, uh, may, I'll ask one more question. And if if anybody has thoughts or questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, but. One of the things that uh, in putting together this event, it just it it was at when I was when I was designing the posters and the promotional stuff that I noticed that all five of us are transplants that we live in you know in a different place from where we were born and and grew up in. and and uh, it was interesting me to me that it happened almost accidentally. Oh, I think did we lose Barbara? Um, yeah, it it happened. Oh, or no, sorry. Uh, 
Oh. Alicia. Somebody, yeah, Alicia, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it happened almost, um, yeah, I mean, it happened totally spontaneously. And I, I really wanted to, um, you know, to to ask you about, you know, what your experience has been, uh, you know, in living in, 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 in to, to what extent being a transplant informs your past or current writing? Uh, and how does that c connect with the appreciation of literature? It is a really, really broad question uh, upon which we can probably dedicate hours. But uh, I, I'm, I, I, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. So I'll keep it broad. And Tamim, yeah. Um... Well, for me, that question doesn't exactly apply because my <laughs> biography is peculiar you know i was born in afghanistan but my mother was american so that was like the first fact of my biography so i didn't get transplanted from a home i was never home i, I was born not at home and my life has been about finding home and i think i'm there now so <laughs> so it's the opposite of what you're saying i'm not a, i'm not a transplant i'm a plant finder. <laughs> that's that's a very unique, right? <laughs> That's wonderful. Wow. But but at the same time, I I, I I am curious. Like you were exposed to Af you did grow up in Afghanistan, right? And you were exposed to some uh, li literature there as a child, or was yeah? How how did does that inform your reading or? Well, like, you know, I read voraciously okay. from the time I could read, which was maybe. <laughs> Six, I was probably six or something, and so I could read. Uh, mm -hmm. I was I was not reading literature in Farsi because it's not there's no children's literature for a six year old, but I was immersed in storytelling because Afghanistan is just such a storytelling culture, and all of my, not all, but you know, many relatives in the Ansari family were just very accomplished storytellers, and what we did. We didn't have TV. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have all that stuff. We just sat around and told stories. So that was like the soup of storytelling out of which part of my sensibilities were formed. And then the other part was I very quickly learned to read as complex as there is, you know, because uh, in the English speaking part of my life, that's what there was. There was books. So I was reading Shakespeare when I was 10. I read all of Shakespeare <laughs> like that. So, you know, that's the, that's the soup out of which I came. And then by the time I came to America and I was, you know, uh, I don't know, by the time I was in college or something, I only in college, I only read for, for my classes. What I did the rest of the time was I listened to music and I, listened, I did nothing but listen to music for 10 years. And then I, I stopped doing that. And I've just been writing ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great answer thank you <laughs> and and i love how reluctant writers are to be put in boxes any box you name it <laughs> we, we resist <laughs> right <laughs> yeah uh this is yeah uh barbara do, uh, do you have a yeah some thoughts um yeah so i uh, i live in sweden but i'm from the united states and i moved to sweden about a year ago now um so I guess one thing that I think has kind of, so the current project I'm working on is another mystery that's set in the States. And my first two novels were set in the South, um, even though I haven't lived, I grew up in the American South, but I haven't lived there um, in quite a long time. Um, so it's interesting to me that the further away I get from that area, the more I, I keep writing about it. So it kind of seems like it almost becomes like more intense for me the, the further I leave it behind um but I guess I am trying to read more um Swedish or Scandinavian literature broadly and that has really been a pleasure um in translation but um I just finished uh Steen Hilgard she's a Danish um novelist I just finished her book The Land of Short Sentences which is about um a young mother who moves to like a very rural part of Denmark and she's really bad at making small talk and she really wants to meet people but she kind of puts them off because she overshares it's it's a very funny book um and I am I'm actually a new mother also so I spend a lot of time reading like Swedish children's literature to my daughter um so a lot of Astrid Lindgren who 
you know, did Pippi Longstocking. I'm sure people know um, know that one. So I'm starting to read more um, literature in Scandinavia. Um, but yeah, I keep writing about the South all the same. Fascinating. Thank you. And Tanya. Well, I love Pippi Longstocking. It's <laughs> very close <laughs> to my heart. Uh, well, I was a nomad before I was a transplant. I mean, I was born in India, but I grew up in Africa. Uh, lived in Middle East for many years. I've lived in the UK and, of course, in in the in the US for for many decades. I think what it's brought to me, especially in my writing, is that I'm often uh, I have a, I've been often an insider with an outsider's point of view, and so you're both an observer and a participant in the action. And I think when I when I'm writing, I like to feel that I'm, you know, at the same time I'm inside and outside the narrative simultaneously in a way. And uh, what I appreciate about other writers who are who are also transplants perhaps is, you know, I just read uh, The Book of Goose by Yun Lee about these two French, mm -hmm. fr this French girls in, uh, girls in a little French village. And what I appreciate is the, the sense of expansion um, that they let, that it brings to their narratives in a way, even while they're compressing the story in, you know, and the characters and the story and the plot between the pages of a book it just makes it so emotionally visceral. So I think there is something very much to be said about being a transplant. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I want to read that book too. Um, and uh, Alicia. Yes. Sorry for that dropout, actually. I was trying to scan our, ch our chat for questions. Um, so um, I have this running joke that I'm always writing a book about a place where I no longer live. Um, that happened before with my first book. It was set in Maine. It was a nonfiction work about a plant closure, um, hence my interest in sort of economic stories or economic fictions and nonfictions. Um, um, so, and I don't know what that's about. I, like Barbara, I, I keep writing about it because my second novel is also set in Northern California. So I, you know, it's clearly um, something that's uh, maybe it is about the distance and that there is something about um, you know, keeping that connection going. I, I think in some ways it's like I never really leave behind a place. I think almost like it's still within me somehow, and that maybe that's where how it's affecting my writing. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on a story collection that features place and and movement across geographical locales. So it's like continuing this place fascination. I think is kind of ongoing for me um, in terms of how it affects my reading. Um, I read a lot of British literature. I mean my um, when I did the uh, my thesis, it was creative and critical. So I wrote a novel, and then I also wrote on um, not just um, a, an American fiction writer. I wrote on uh, Jennifer Egan's work, um, a visit from the Goon Squad, and then also Ali Smith's *The Accidental*. Um, and so I'm very I read quite a lot of British and, and um, uh, Scottish writers as well. And part of that is because it is contemporary fiction, and British and American is kind of my thing, um, critically, but also. You know, it's where I live now, and I. It's a way to know a place, right? Is to read its read read the work that's come out of it. So, um, but like everyone else here, I read really broadly all the time. It's just you know, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, ideally on a good day. So, um, you know, it's it's what we do as writers. I I if I had to choose, I'd probably choose reading over writing because <laughs> it's so pleasurable. Um, but I think I, I write because I love to read. So it's kind of what yeah. makes me too. Yeah. Rel relatable. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I know we are time and I know some people have to leave and if you need to leave, please do. It's again, thank you for being here. I do have one more question from the audience um, that I think is really interesting and I'd love to hear what um, you all think about this uh, or have to say about this. Uh, so I think it's my friend, my, Michael, uh, asking, how do you narrow down the infinite number of possible narrative choices, people, places, and plots to fit in one contained narrative? And yeah, uh, to me, you narrowed them down to six six main protagonists, right? Yeah, but it wasn't uh, six main protagonists. You know, yes, yes. <clears throat> I'll give you another little yes. interesting tidbit about this novel. Yes. The very origins of it were that me and two other guys 
all of whom worked at a newspaper called The Scribe, which was a collectively operated newspaper in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> After we that was over, we said to each other, let's write a, a novel collectively. And, <laughs> and we started writing this novel. The other guys didn't produce anything, so mm -hmm. it was just me then. <laughs> but from the very beginning, mm -hmm. what I conceived of it was, was not anybody's point of view I compared it to a, uh, a basketball game. You know, when you're really watching a basketball game, you're watching all five and how they interact and how they interweave. That's what that's what you're watching. So that was the attitude I took to Sinking the Ark. You know, it's not it's not this or that person. We keep slipping into the different characters' point of view, but the story is how they all interact with each other. So that's my answer to that one. That's yeah, that's a great. That's so hard to do. Yeah. Barbara. So the question is, how do you narrow down all the possible narrative possibilities into the ones that you chose? <laughs> um, you know, the way I kind of like helplessly depend on other readers to help me figure that out, but um, but it's, I'm, it's very hard for me to see in my own work, um, you know, if something feels extraneous or if something needs to be more developed. But um, there there was like a really good exercise I remember doing from um, a book by Sandra Schofield that the title is escaping me, but um, it's something on about like the last draft or the first draft or the millionth draft, I'm not sure, but the last draft, I think is what it's called. Um, and she talks about going through your entire manuscript and kind of asking these questions of each character like why are they there why do they need to be there um, and I do remember doing a fair amount of those kinds of exercises and that really helped me see um, which characters were bringing something new and authentic um, and at what points of view they were doing that I mean which ones maybe weren't I guess as distinctive so um, yeah so that's that's a really great question I'm not actually sure how any writer does it <laughs> That is a very tough uh, question yeah. to answer <laughs> because I think like you, I also had to, uh, you know, pick and choose what serves the story and what does not. And then in my case, because everyone was would have been so unfamiliar with the city of Dubai, I needed one character who would kind of be your guide. And through her, mm -hmm. she, you would like meet the people and go to the restaurants and walk down streets and, you know, go to the to the mall um so yeah it that that is that is a a question i think everyone struggles with because you know so much and how do you compact it into something that makes a dynamic and a story that that moves forward definitely that is something we all struggle with i think <laughs> that's it's great to create that that character who can do some of the storytelling <laughs> Alicia. Um, so um, remind me of the question again, sorry. Um, it's how, the question is, how do you narrow all the yeah, possible- all the various offered, all the various decisions, the narrative choices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think it's trial and error, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, what I did on Dry River is that I had, um, I had drafted a written <laughs> person, then I went to third person, to see if I could get out of the interior monologue that I had running for for Sarah to, for Sarah that in, in some ways I one of the dangers of first person is that you can do too much interior monologue and it can really make it claustrophobic for the reader. So to correct that, I did two different things. Um, first off, I revised the novel, the first ninety pages, into third person um, as an experiment. And then I workshopped that, and that's actually what I workshopped with John Dufresne at um, Mendocino Writers Conference. And he agreed with me that first person was the right choice. So I went back to first person. The upside of it, and I tell my students this a lot, is that I learned from um, shifting the novel from first into third person. It, it actually took me into Ty's head, who's the you know other major protagonist, which then enabled me to shape his character and make him more present. So in a way, there's no mistakes in the world of writing. There's just getting the words right on the page eventually, right? Um, and then the other piece, too, is that um, I, um, in doing that, I I got to know my characters just a lot better. And um, And then the other thing I did to control the interior monologue was that after I went back to first person, I gave myself a rule 
that when I was in Sarah's head, I could do no more than three actual sentences on the page that were interior monologue. And it's something I tell my students a lot because um, that's a, really a mistake everybody makes on first person narrative. So I think that sort of answers your question, which I thought was a great question. Um, <laughs> but um, I think for everyone, it's a little bit different, but I, I do think you have to see what works on the page. And then you just, as an editor once said to me, you just you just change the words till they all fit in the right place. <laughs> well, they're finally there. Which which can never stop, right? Which can never stop. Which, <laughs> so so have, so it's so great to have these books to that 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 do stop us. The the, the books are out, and uh, thank you all for being here one more time. And I really encourage you to uh, buy these books. I'm gonna put I put all of the links uh, uh, here in the chat, um, and I included my collection of stories. Um, um, and I, uh, I also want to see if um, any anybody else uh, has another way in which we can support you. If anybody wants to announce events, I know we are so distributed geographically, but if anybody else wants to put more links in the chat, please do so. And yes, I, I please do uh, support small and independent presses uh, in any way that you can. They do, uh, they bring us the most innovative literature today, I think. So uh, thank you. And yeah. Thank I, you. Thank you. And thank you all. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. I got to leave now. Yeah. So okay. I'm going to end. Farewell. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Lisa. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.